In 1967, a group of American scientists working from a small boat off Bermuda began to draw some fascinating conclusions about these strange sounds from the sea. They were led by Dr. Roger Payne, who already knew that this alien oratorio was being produced by the great humpback whales. They come here to mate and give birth to calves, who thus spend the first weeks of their lives immersed in the songs of their elders. There came a night when, listening through headphones, I could hear the sounds of whales booming and echoing in the vaults of the sea, arias and cantatas and recitatives welling up out of the ocean. And it occurred to me that these were songs. During that exciting first season, I listened to the seemingly random calls of the humpbacks and slowly realized that they were repeating themselves in long, complex patterns of sound. They were singing. You begin to feel the motion of the boat and realize that all the swells that are lifting and falling are actually setting the rhythm of the song. It's a kind of experience which is more wonderful than anything I know that's ever happened to me in my life. Roger is a trained musician, and when he compared the structure of whale songs with human music, he found he was dealing with the most elaborate, non-human vocal displays ever discovered. Like a human singer, when a humpback whale repeats his song, he breathes in such a way as not to disturb the rhythm. Humpbacks seem to have an overall concept of their song in mind. It suggests they're conscious of their performance, For Roger, this is much more than a set of musical revelations. It changed the way he thought about whales, elevating them to something much more than animals. It was the beginning of an all-encompassing passion for whales and a desire to be in their company for the rest of his life. He found a place to do that almost at the end of the world in Patagonia. There is a bay here, utterly isolated, alive with right whales, the rarest baleen whales in the world. When the wind blows just right in this bay, these whales lift their tails into the air, hold them broadside to the wind, and go sailing. When they come to the surface for a breath, they gamble along back upwind. And since this and all other behavior accompanying sailing is play, it looks like they sail just for the fun of it. The land here is the raised floor of the sea, and it's littered with whale bones, millions of years old. I first came down this track, which leads to the beach, in 1970, 
to build a field station from which to conduct a long, benign study of right whales. Petrels, shearwaters, and albatrosses revel in the high winds that give these latitudes the name Roaring Forties. Patagonia, in fact, owes its remote, pristine status to this wild weather. The winds dominate everything here. This productive ocean supports tens of thousands of seals and sea lions. It's too dry for trees, in fact, only bushes survive. But an abundance of strange creatures is adapted to these conditions, like this guanaco. It's a sort of a lowland llama which is adapted to a semi-desert climate. To this untouched paradise, where the animals have almost no fear of people, Roger came every year bringing his family with him. Roger was able to spend up to 16 hours a day watching the whales in a setting of utter perfection from a little tin hut high on the cliffs. I built this place years ago, about 20 years ago. And I come here every year, and I brought my family here when they were young, and I've watched my children grow up with these whales. I've seen them in kayaks next to whales. I've seen them at night with sea lions holding the kayak in the bow and then squeezing it in the whole kayak like a pumpkin seed going off into the distance. So this is the place that I grew up, the whales grew up, my children grew up. It's the place which I love the most. And when I come here, I feel a sense of connection with these whales that I don't feel in other places anywhere in the world. This, to me, is it. This is where I would rather be than any spot on Earth. What I'm looking at here is a group of males that are trying to mate with a female. This is a mating group, actually. When a male gets a female underwater successfully, under these circumstances, it's possible for him actually to mate with her and then another male comes along and it's his turn to mate and another male comes along and the trick is to be last if you're last then she is fullest of your sperm and that means you have the greatest chance of being a father sort of an, an after you alphonse type of situation now we're talking here enormous quantities of sperm the largest quantities that have ever been produced in the history of life on earth as far as we know Basically, the testes of a blue whale, and that's the biggest whale that ever lived, they're about 70 kilos, about 150 pounds. So what is this much smaller right whale? How big would its testes be? And the answer is one metric ton, 2,200 pounds. And the question is, why does it have these enormous testes? Because they're in sperm competition, these males. They have to have a chance not only to fertilize the egg of the female, but to actually wash out the contribution of the previous male and replace it with their own. Otherwise, there's no chance at all that they're going to be the father. But the fascinating thing is that they're so gentle with people that you think that they're very gentle with each other. No way. They're, in fact, very rough with each other. The males fight each other using their callosities, these thickened lumps of skin which are on the head. The females are, in fact, avoiding males at all costs most of the time. And the problem is what's actually happening here is forced mating, what looks like it's rape, actually. Gang rape, a whole bunch of males pursuing the same female until she flees for her life. But she doesn't quite flee for her life. She looks as though at times she's cooperative with the whole procedure. And then what she does is she will run away from a group reaching, leaping into the air as she goes but she'll choose to leave the group closest to that male with whom she eventually mates and then leaves. If there were places like this that people could come to all over the world where there were animals of any kind and where they could 
live with these animals and get to know them and become friends with them and raise their children along with these situations. My feeling is we would have an understanding that we haven't had for 10,000 years back when we did live in a world which was filled with animals and myths of animals and stories and thoughts and ideas of animals where animals were where it was at, not cities. We've moved into cities out of that world. I think it's time that we moved in some way in our minds back into that world. A lot of people can't understand why we need wilderness, pure wilderness, but if you've had the luck, as I've had, and it's just luck, to be in contact with pure wilderness, you see why there is this need. It's a need for sanity, really, a kind of sanity that isn't accessible to us if we're living in a city, only if we're living in this kind of environment. On lucky mornings, I wake to find whales just off the beach, and I can go for a walk in the company of a whale. She's in her element, and I'm in mine. This is her normal distance from the beach. She keeps the baby just in shore of her, out of reach of such things as marauding bands of killer whales. Over the years, my children developed friendly contact with the other animals that live around the bay, and three of them went on to study biology. My oldest daughter, Holly, worked with this community of sea lions. They're intensely curious, and it's sometimes easy to forget that they're wild animals who can be really rough with each other. Hi, guys. Hello, everybody. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, panic, come on over. Each year, the focus of our work is an aerial census on right whales in the bays of Peninsula Valdez. The right whale's head is adorned with a pattern of distinctive white patches of raised skin, which are called callosities. These markings are photographed to identify individual whales. In 1990, we used for the first time an ultralight aircraft to take pictures. We now recognize over a thousand individual right whales by their distinctive markings, and we've tracked them all over the place, as far away as 1,500 miles. The year's photographs are brought back to the Whale Conservation Institute in Boston, where my colleague Vicki Roundtree spends the winter months identifying the whales. There are five different populations of right whales in the South Atlantic. Each group follows its own migratory route. This next one is a white marked calf. It's the calf of whale 7175. And here it is, right next to the dock in Puerto Pyramides. And um, she always seems to have white marked calves. She had another one in 1990. This is the, her 87 calf. Mm. And here's the 1990 calf. Wow, oh, it's got a little white mark on the shoulder. I yep. see it, yeah. Yep. And finally, this is the best one. Um, this is a whale that we got in 1990 that Jose Tudor Palasso saw in Brazil. I think it's a match. If you could, what do you think about comparing the closities on that and this other one?
You know, there's really nothing that you can do or experience on this earth which is, I think, more interesting, more beautiful than listening to the sounds of these whales from the sea at night, alone in Patagonia. Over the years that I've had a chance to do this, I've learned enough so that I feel that I understand at least some sense of what these animals are saying. For example, at night when we're sitting and listening to these sounds, we can hear when dolphins are in the area because there's a special sort of boof that these whales make when dolphins come by, which is, I think, their way of saying, you know, go away, beat it. Uh, there are sounds that are made by whales that are approaching a group when they're coming into a mating group, which are sort of very suave. You could be suave as a whale. One of my favorites is a sneeze. It goes sort of like this. And echoes off all the cliffs. The terns understand that as well. Over the years that I've had a chance to do this, I've learned enough so that I feel that I understand at least some sense of what these animals are saying. Only a small sense, but a sense which makes a connection between this ocean and this land. Using techniques invented in Patagonia for the benign identification of whales, Roger and his team began to turn their attention to other long whale migrations, hoping to build a map of those areas which are vital to their survival. Humpbacks, for example, who they had learned to identify by their distinctive tail markings, make an annual journey to remote parts of Alaska, having swum all the way from Hawaii. The ultralight aircraft was shipped up the American continent and strapped to the cabin of the whale research vessel, Crusader. Our pilot and I took it on a test flight to see if it had survived its 10,000 mile odyssey and hopefully to find some whales. We certainly had found whales, so we went back for the cameraman. And as we made our approach, not quite the landing we'd planned. Although the ultralight didn't survive the crash, we did, and we continued our search for the whales. In the last hours of the expedition, we got a report from a fishing vessel that there were humpbacks group feeding near him. With the help of a helicopter, we observed this extraordinary ritualized feast in which the humpbacks are engulfing whole schools of fish with jaws which can open to a distance of 15 feet.
These whales are fishing cooperatively, and it's according to an intricate game plan. The lead whale is always the same individual, as are the whales to its right and left. In fact, they're playing positions. It's just like people on a team. Cooperative group behavior like this is probably the closest thing we have to evidence of mind in these animals. The most comfortable place on any boat is lying in the bow nets. It's as if you're being carried along in its outstretched arms, while beneath you there are dolphins riding in the bow wave. It's the closest you ever get to these animals when they're behaving naturally. It's a skill which they seem to have learned from riding the bow waves of whales. And the whole masterful performance seems to be choreographed with a series of whistles and clicks. Dolphins are the smallest whales. Their largest relative is the sperm whale. Sperm whales are creatures that can reach 60 feet in length, and they have the largest brain which has ever existed in the history of life on Earth. There are two kinds of whales in the world, those with teeth and those without. The family with teeth includes dolphins and these sperm whales. I've studied sperm whales in several parts of the world and I'm particularly interested in how they use sound to communicate and to hunt. As a young scientist, the first experiment Roger did was to toss insect-sized pebbles into the flight path of bats and listen to their echolocation clicks as they dove on them. So instead of pebbles, I dropped large rocks in front of sperm whales and listened to their clicks, which are nothing but a slowed-down version of a bat's sonar. We could hear hunting clicks from the whales, but whether or not they were directing them at the rocks, that remains to be determined. Dr. Jonathan Gordon is studying the clicks of sperm whales from his boat, Song of the Whale. He's trying to count the number of sperm whales in an area by listening to their clicks. They may also use the clicks to keep track of each other. This is our uh, towed hydrophone, the main lifting device. It's oh, a, a rope tail to make sure it tows properly. Great. And all this is just a long garden hose full, uh, full of oil with a couple of uh, hydrophones inside. And just from that, we can get a fair idea of where the whales are. What is the sort of a, the regular sound that we're hearing now? What's that? Yeah, I think, I think what we're hearing now is uh, whales diving deep, making their feeding dives. And these regular clicks are, are just, well, we think they're just a sort of broadband general echolocation. And every so often, I think we just heard one now, it's creak. 
Oh, yes, 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 I heard yeah, that. That's right. I think that's them actually homing in on a prey object or at least using a finer form of echolocation. Oh, that's neat. And what about the other day when we were, we had whales around, we heard something that went rapidly sort of... What was that? Well, I think there's more rapid clicks are, again, just a form of echolocation. We often hear those when a whale's up on the surface and investigating the boat. Or if you're swimming, you'll see a whale coming directly towards you, and it will make these rapid clicks. You don't think that's aggressive, then? Well, I think if they were behaving aggressively, they'd certainly make that noise. But we, we hear it all the time when they're not behaving aggressively. That's actually quite a directional sound. Ooh, right? What is that loud sound, the one that just occurred? It sounded like a... Uh, I mean, much, much louder than the other ones. Is that what you call a gunshot? Sperm whales can descend to depths of over a mile. It's here in the abyss that sperm whales catch their prey, including two species of giant squid. There's a theory that sperm whales can make sounds of high enough intensity to stun their victims. These sounds are appropriately called gunshots. A colleague of mine was once knocked backwards by a blast of sound from a sperm whale calf. Who knows what such a sound from an adult might have done? Although I've seen every species of large whale, I had never seen a bottlenosed whale. It's a bizarre species. They get up to 39 feet in length. And the only thing we know about them is that they occupy specific stretches of ocean floor. So to find them, we set sail to a specific latitude and longitude in the North Atlantic. And when we got out 130 miles, right where I'd been told they were, there they were. These whales live in a murky world beneath the water. They have a world which is very like the fog, where there could be another whale just beyond their field of view, just as there could be a ship beyond ours. We use radar to detect that ship, and these whales use sounds with which to detect each other. What little we know about this species strongly suggests that bottlenose whales live in long-lasting social groups, which is a behavior that's highly correlated with intelligence. Elephants, people, and many dolphin species are an example. Because of this and the inquisitive behavior of this species and its obviously tight social bonds, I'm led to believe that this may be the smartest whale of them all. Humans have never brought to extinction any species that occurred worldwide, but we came vanishingly close with the right whale. The whaling age was the sort of ultimate macho age where people went out and pitted themselves against the whale. I mean, you know, give me a break. How hard would it be to harpoon one of these whales? You just sort of ease your boat up alongside it, and the whale comes to you, and you throw a harpoon in it. I mean... Ridiculous. Whaling became a crucial part of the American commercial and industrial revolution. 
Whalebone, or baleen, was the springy plastic of its day. Sperm whale oil lit a world which had yet to refine petroleum, and early forms of fine machinery were lubricated with it. Only the bone, blubber, and oil were considered to be of value. American whaling ships hunted over all oceans and founded great fortunes for New England. Returning with the oil from a single whale could recoup the full cost of sending out a ship, and many came home with 40 times that amount. Early this century, when these scenes were filmed, life aboard a whaling ship was incredibly hard and took men from their families for several years at a time. It took many of them to a watery grave because there's probably not a man in these pictures who knew how to swim. Whaling in America spread out all over the world until it had established what amounted to whaling colonies in places like this, the island of Fayal and the Azores. The original whaling stations in the Azores were really sort of modified ships, ships brought ashore in simple buildings like this. Here's a winch which would spin the whale in the water, removing and unpeeling the blubber. The blubber was then cut into chunks, the chunks were put into a machine over here which would cut them into thin leaves called Bible pieces. They would take those Bible pieces, carry them over to these tripods, which were three-legged, massive iron pots that were fueled with a fire down below, made of wood at first, and then later with the pieces of the blubber which had then been tried out or the fat removed, so that the whale was actually boiling itself. Then the fumes would rise from these pots up, up through these open roofs, out through the central section with its magnificent structure of beams, and that would be the mark of a whaling station, a great cloud of smoke rising from it at all times. As recently as 1968, when I was last here, this bay was filled with whales. There was a pool of blood at the bottom of this ramp. The gutters ran with blood, which came from the whales that were being cut up up above. And they were, in fact, still processing sperm whales. They would drag them on this slippery surface, which was covered with the grease and wax of the whales, over to the top here, the flensing plan, where they would then attach cables from the steam winches to the whale, pull off the slabs of blubber, cut them into sections, and lift them up on that gantry crane into the top of the building where they were processed for their oil. Nothing was wasted, only the whale. With the coming of modern whaling, things got more and more industrialized. Whaling ships were equipped with flash freezers that could preserve 10 kilo blocks of whale meat caught in the Antarctic for consumption back home in Japan. The whales didn't stand a chance. But in 1975, a small organization in Canada, calling itself Greenpeace, chartered a boat and sallied forth to confront the whalers on the high seas. The whalers were in high-speed ships, so powerful that even when towing four dead whales, they could outdistance a Greenpeace boat. But these were determined people. The Soviets had never seen anything like it. Whale activists risking their lives to board their boats on the high seas. Some of them even drove their inflatables between the whalers' harpoons and the whales. Factory ship whaling would never be the same. Funding got better for Greenpeace and their boats faster until they were able to graduate to methods that were a bit more intimidating. These were signs of the time. Will you please welcome very warmly Dr. Roger Payne. Thanks, thanks. That's great. The world noticed also, and the movement grew. And I was drawn into a never-ending series of meetings and rallies, but with one purpose in mind. A lot of other scientists began to get involved in the International Planning Commission, and we began to win, big time. We even got a moratorium passed, though I don't think it will last. Whales now hold a strong grip on the collective human imagination. And without 
realizing it I, myself, I said that I felt I really didn't want to live in a world without whales. My feeling is, no, that is too much madness. The launch of the Voyager spacecraft symbolized this new consciousness. It carried greetings in 60 human languages to any alien who might find it. And it also carried the song of a humpback whale. The songs of whales had escaped the sea, overcome the hearts of their age-old enemies, humans, and were now aboard their spacecraft, bound on a two and a half billion year voyage that would carry them throughout the galaxy. In the years that followed the moratorium on whaling, years that saw the fledgling conservation activists form powerful international action groups, a strange calm descended upon the world of the whales. And from this calm, a series of almost magical encounters began to take place between the human race and the whales. One of the most delightful was here in the little town of Dingle in Ireland. Soon, tourists were coming from all over the world to meet this lone ambassador from the marine wilderness. Called Fungi, this animal seemed to relish all forms of company but rejected any form of reward other than affection and physical contact. Sheila Stokes is one of the people who first achieved contact with fungi and in the spring of 1990, I went to Dingle to witness just how intimate this contact had become. Oh. Down here is where you can see the dolphin usually. Great. When we first met the dolphin, he was very cautious. And he was, you could tell he was interested because he didn't actually go away from us, but he kept a certain distance. And we spent probably, um, eight weekends here. Come, we'd come for five days and then go back to Cork for three days and then another five days. And after the, about eight weeks of that, he first actually made physical contact with us. Now, he's totally wild. Are you feeding him? Do you reward him? No. We, we never ever wanted to feed him. Um, I mean, we have pets at home, and there's lots of animals around that would rely on human um, feeding and, and human care. But this dolphin just comes to us because he wants to come to us, not for any reward or any feeding. In fact, I doubt if we could feed him if we wanted to, because he's so good at feeding himself, he, doesn't, he wouldn't need us to. So, basically, what you're telling me is that this dolphin chooses to be with you with me and thousands of other people that come along to Dingle now to see him. He just seems to revel in human company and human interaction. And that's humans in the water, humans in boats, humans in canoes, windsurfers, whatever. What I'm wondering is, is whether or not this animal is unique or whether it's the you who is unique or people who have swum with these dolphins. Do you think people could do that with any other wild bottlenose dolphin? Well, I wouldn't be an expert, but I've sort of grown up with this feeling that dolphins are friendly. I don't know where the feeling comes from, and I, I believe that... I mean, I, I've met other bottlenose dolphins, and they were friendly as well, and I just believe that anybody who's prepared to make the effort and spend the time would eventually have a breakthrough and, and develop a relationship. On the other side of the world, in Shark Bay, Australia, is a little stretch of land along the coast where this same species, the bottlenose dolphin, has made extensive contact with people. If you take a boat along these beaches, you attract a dolphin. This is a female who suffered an appalling sunburn. The researchers believe that while she was in heat, she may have been chased by males up onto a sandbar where she must have been stranded for several hours until the tide rescued her. 
Has she come over to be touched and petted, or is she more interested in what your hand's holding? That's an important question, because in this area, the dolphins are given fish regularly. On the other hand, Shark Bay teems with fish, so free fish can't be the only attractant. These dolphins work their way into the shallows right up against the beach, and there they just hang around looking the humans over. It does look like some kind of deep curiosity, a kind of fascination with people. And thousands of people now travel all the way up the coast of Western Australia to reciprocate this fascination, spontaneously posing on the shore to be fed. They actively guard their fish franchise from other dolphins and pass it to their offspring, just the same as the human owners of this resort protect and pass on their franchise to their offspring. But is it just fish and business, or do the dolphins show any genuine affection? As we saw with the dingle dolphin, affection can be enough. Dolphins in captivity show animals. It makes the hair rise on many people's necks. But is that response in the best interest of the dolphins? Is that what they want? This is the Dolphin Research Center. It used to be called Flipper Sea School, where the original films for the Flipper series on television were made. And it's a wonderful place. It's a place where people can come and interact with dolphins in as close to the wild as you could imagine. It's been running like this for about 30 years. And it started originally as a facility just to train dolphins with not much in mind as to what was going to happen. But what has now happened here is a wonderful place where humans and dolphins can come together in a contact which is unique in all the world. I came to Florida because my friend who runs this place claims that the dolphins stay inside even when their pen doors were left open to the sea. Could it be that they prefer being with people to being with their own kind? I wanted to see for myself. Come on out. Oh, that's wonderful. When we opened the gate and I swam out, sure enough, I had to coax them to get them to come through. And when they did, they went right back in. I could only persuade them to stay by keeping them occupied. As tempting as it was to think that these dolphins prefer humans to freedom, many of them have been born here. And besides, all that play was rewarded with fish. But Jews simply cannot leave a place like this without taking away the strong feeling that these dolphins do like people, because there's no avoiding that open gate. Roger had, in fact, long suspected a natural affinity between the human race and whales as a result of his experiences in Patagonia. The huge right whales here are undoubtedly attracted to people in boats. Here we are, we're being charged with this enormous 30-ton creature. I mean, you know, there is its breath, for example. And what is going to happen to us? The answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. This is a totally calm, gentle animal. And it isn't the animal that our grandfathers told us that it was. They didn't have the experiences that they said they had. It's just a nonsense. Look, this may come up so that I can actually touch it. Let me see if I can. Yeah, there. I just touched her head, and that was the bump of the water on her, of her body. This ferocious creature. Why is this happening? And my feeling is that she's I think she's bored, bored stiff, and hey, where's something interesting that's going on? And we don't try to mate with her, we don't bother her. So basically, she comes over and looks us over. And uh, you can see her eye, it's right in underneath that large white patch, which is right down there. And her eye is, that's what she's looking at us with. She's looking at the motor, and she sees my feet probably in the water. And the more she hangs around, the safer it obviously is. There's nothing, we're not doing anything to her. We're not harpooning her, or lancing her, or driving the boat over her. And so she just hangs out, blowing every now and then.
my feeling is that for all the history of humanity, maybe whales like people. Maybe they would like to get to know us. Maybe they would like to have a chance to make some friends with us, just the way in the modern world we think we would like to make friends with them. And the point is that we haven't given ourselves a chance to do that, nor the whales a chance to do that. And this is the first time it's happening. And when you see whales come up to boats like this and touch the boat and bump the boat, you begin to realize that the whale is the one who's really making the... It's the one that's being the most forward, not us. And this close contact is not peculiar to these very friendly right whales. Elsewhere in the world, as soon as friendly whales outnumber the tourist boats, it is the boats that become the scarce resource, and it is the whales who start competing for them. These observations of friendliness have been made in the context of a whale watching industry, which in the last decade has boomed worldwide, due in no small part to Roger's advocacy and promotion of whales. Literally everywhere that there are whales that can be watched from boats, people are going out to watch them. In Canada's St. Lawrence Seaway, flotillas of little boats carry thousands of tourists each summer to watch the white beluga whales. They are undeterred by the legal requirement to wear orange survival suits, though the whales they're watching swim in waters in which you could only survive a few minutes. Whale watching has revitalized the economies of little towns like Saguenay, and these and many other small coastal communities are thriving on whale-oriented tourism. So after 800 years of what amounted to a war on whales, we have finally all but stopped and have replaced whaling with a new industry, whale watching. You're here now at ground zero of whale watching for the world, Stellwagen Bank off Boston. To this area come hundreds, in fact thousands of tourists every year, and even on a horrible, windy, rainy day like this, there are dozens of boats off the area, everyone here for the same fix. Watching these whale enthusiasts gives me great hope because no one ever forgets the sight of their first whale. The people come here from all over the world and they go away lifelong advocates for whales. Yes, we come from Gloucester, England. Yeah, long way, but well worth it for this. Tremendous. In spite of these horrible conditions and all this weather. Oh, this just makes it all the more exciting. But if you are seriously looking for the ultimate fix in whale watching, there is really only one place on Earth, the huge seas off the South Island of New Zealand, where you find lone bull sperm whales. At 50 or 60 tons, these are the largest predators that have ever existed on Earth. The sperm whale bulls come here as regularly as clockwork, the largest having traveled more than 2,000 miles from the equator, leaving behind in those more gentle climbs, females and calves. They are here to take part in an epic feast. Upwelling currents striking the underwater flanks of New Zealand bring nutrients to the surface which fuel an explosion of plant life, which in turn fuels an entire food chain which gorges itself on the abundance. And sitting on the pinnacle of this food pyramid 
are giant sperm whales. This maelstrom is caused by a vast host of feeding fish. The hundreds of O's breaking the surface are the open mouths of large fish in frenzied pursuit of an even larger school of tiny fish. And when the main frenzy has passed, hundreds of seabirds drop in to pick up the remains, the larger sea species driving off the smaller ones. Roger came to New Zealand to film the potentially aggressive bull sperm whales underwater, something that had never been done here before. Unfortunately, the first very large animal Roger and the crew encountered was a whale with a questionable reputation for occasionally putting on tough displays around boats. It earned him the nickname Hoon, the Maori word for hooligan. Nevertheless, our cameraman, Tony Miller, went into the water. As we watched Hoon dive into the murk, we assumed he would descend a mile down, hunting for an hour. But my heart stopped as Hoon surfaced and turned right towards Tony. Hoon probably had no intention of really hurting Tony. He was just acting, I think, like some tough kid on the block who shoulders you aside as he walks past. There are other kinds of conflicts between whales and people. Here on the coast of Newfoundland, as whale conservation succeeds, the number of whales increase, leading to direct confrontation between the whales and the fishermen. The species that cause the fishermen so much trouble is the 40-foot-long humpback whale, which needs to find enormous quantities of fish each day. Dr. John Liam a Canadian biologist is devoting his life to solving this problem. We've got 30,000 fishermen that earn a living from these shores, and the productive areas are in fact very few, and whales and fishermen tend to occur in the same place, and fishermen have to put all their nets there. So in areas like this, where there's a lot of fish and so on, uh, there's, we're ringed with nets. This is not an ocean wilderness. What's happening to oceans around the world, and certainly in Newfoundland, is that the, the ocean is essentially being domesticated in the same way that the prairies have been domesticated and so on. 
Uh, so there's lots of hazards for whales coming into these waters. And as whale populations increase, uh, the fishermen that have their nets there are facing increasing problems with them colliding with the nets. What do the fishermen think of the whales? I mean, what's their attitude towards them? I think basically they're a pest. Uh, they're like a marine rat. Uh, you know, a net uh, for a man to earn a, a living for his family costs about five to ten thousand dollars here. This is a cod trap. Uh, he's got maybe three to four weeks to earn his whole year's living with that net. The living he makes is not big. It's five to ten thousand dollars. But if during that peak period of productivity, a whale collides with a net, it's an absolute disaster for the fisherman. You can ruin his entire year's livelihood. Not only does he cost uh, money as far as repairs to the net, but he loses this week, two weeks, three weeks, where he really has to earn most of his year's income. And so whales are not thought of kindly. I think most of the world, you know, uh, people would be amazed that somebody would wonder how many whales we should have. You know, here, people wonder how many whales are enough. You know, should we have piles and piles of whales, or do we have enough now? Uh, I think in Boston or in London, people couldn't imagine not, you know, there couldn't be too many whales, but that's certainly not true here. In recent years, fishermen have had to use more nets to earn a living. Some of the fish stocks have been down. Uh, whales have been protected for some time, and humpbacks seem to be doing very well, and their numbers seem to be increasing. The conflict between the fishermen and the whales is getting worse year by year. John's volunteer whale rescue efforts run day and night, fair weather or foul, as he risks his life to release the roughly 70 humpback whales that get trapped in fishing nets here every year. The key to the entire operation is getting the cooperation of the fishermen. Maybe get a lesson. Can you hear it? Oh, you. There it goes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Great. That was nice timing. John received a call to rescue a live, entrapped humpback. We're counting a fly first, if we get on the side, so we can't move him. He's pumping there now. Ah, he's, he's not going to, that rope is not going to go over that boy. Yeah. In the early mornings here, the water is never more than a degree or two above freezing. John Lean's been doing this work for many years, and he's saved hundreds of whales. But there's a price. He gets severe sinus pains from the constant immersion of his head so he can see how to plan his next move. Yet John Lean has learned that if he can only achieve eye contact with a trapped whale, there will often be a change in the whale's attitude from fear to relaxation, and sometimes even cooperation. Because all whales must surface to breathe, the great mystery is why they remain so calm when the nets and the ropes begin to drag them under. What should never be forgotten as you watch this extraordinary man at work just a few inches from the whale is that the animal is about the size of an 18-wheeler. Okay. I've never seen a man so dedicated to keeping peace between people and whales. If anything ever happens to John, this place could explode.
There was one mighty lurch, and it was over. She's gone. She's fine. Travis not hurt a bit. That's fabulous, John. Good for you. What's that? Congratulations. <laughs> By the time we arrived at the cod trap, where a dead whale had been reported, decomposition gases had brought the vast corpse to the surface. But the incident was doubly tragic. There were two dead whales in the net. That's the first time John had ever seen such a thing. This whale is dead, and the gases of decomposition have expanded his throat. That's the size the throat gets to, presumably, when they're catching fish and filling with water. But these stiffening members right in here, watch them move in relation to the other stiffening members. This is much thinner skin in between. You can see them move back and forth right in this area as the whale heaves on these swells. John knew from past experience that the only way to free the corpse from the net upon which these fishermen are so dependent was to cut the netted tail off using a small kitchen knife. But the wind was rising, and it had to be done in appallingly difficult conditions of cold and surge. It was nearly midnight in these high northern latitudes before the carcass had been cut free and could be allowed to drift out to sea. So, John, what's the bottom line? What do you want to see happen here in the future? What I would like to see is the fishermen involved effectively in local conservation groups of some kind where they would look after the ocean, they would protect the stocks that live there, and they would preserve it for their sons and daughters forever. John Bean and Roger Payne now agree that parts of the world should be set aside as marine parks for whales. And in fact, by 1983, Roger had persuaded the government of Argentina to accord that status to Peninsula Valdez. Unfortunately, by the close of the 1980s, something started to happen to those beaches which would sour all these dreams of a world in which whales and human beings would coexist in a state of mutual respect. Significant numbers of whales were washing up dead here and on beaches all around the world. It's curious that just offshore from where a dead whale lies, we often see other whales lingering. I've wondered whether these are the companions of the dead, awaiting its return or grieving for their loss. The local seagulls have been landing on the backs of right whales and pecking at their skin. This apparently harmless activity may be indicative of a far more serious problem which is facing the whales, a mysterious skin condition. We noticed that these whales in this bay were getting a series of marks down their back. Each mark is about that size. And we believe that what they are is pox marks. Pox like chicken pox or small pox. The problem is, is that what we think is happening here is that these animals may have had their immune systems suppressed 
by poisonous, toxic substances in the sea, things like PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. If that's the case, we have a total nightmare on our hands. What we have really is the equivalent of AIDS, AIDS of the sea. AIDS destroys its patients by destruction of their immune systems. And in fact, AIDS was first discovered by a skin condition in human beings. Because the pox marks could be, in fact, revealing something which is so dire, we're going to have to do something that I hate doing, which is to take a small sample from these animals. We'll just scrape a little bit of skin from the area of the pox marks and then examine it and see whether or not it's the virus we believe it to be. Roger took samples from the corpses and others from the live whales, but the examinations he made in the rustic lab back at camp revealed little. Increasingly, however, Roger began to suspect that this lovely bay might be concealing toxic chemicals that were mysteriously poisoning the whales. There's two things that happen as a result of marine pollution that we're starting to suspect are very serious. One is the increase in the incidence of red tides, highly toxic organisms which can kill people instantly if they're eat shellfish that have these red tides. The other is the possible diminution or reduction of the ability of an immune system to fight infection. What I'm hoping the samples that we're examining now will show from these whales is a connection between marine pollution and the presence in the whales of an ever-increasing concentration of these marine pollutants because in recent years, when the red tides were building, we also have started to see this sudden increase of pox marks on the whales. Something, I think, is affecting their immune systems. And I think it's pollutants, and these samples, I hope, will show that. And the deaths were not confined to the whales. The pattern is similar to one Roger encountered on a visit to another beautiful stretch of coast, the Otago Peninsula on the South Island of New Zealand. This is the home of some of the rarest seabirds on Earth, in particular the yellow-eyed penguins, of which there are now only a tiny percent of the original population. In the past few years, there has been a dramatic die-off of these very rare birds. So much so that a local farmer, Howard Magruder, has turned his home and garden into a rescue station. Come on. Hey. Oh, listen to this. Quite good, mate. What's uh, that? Looks like a regurgitation has turned. Oh, it's being stupid. It's not, they're not over. There we are. <laughs> come on, Pete. Come on. Come on. Come on. Now, this bird is going into the malt. It's a critical time of year for it. It came in here three weeks ago, <laughs> um, weighing about four kilograms, and it would have died. But we've got it back up to eight. It's become quite vicious. It's different from any of the other yellow-eyed penguins we've had. Oh, that's me. <laughs> My interest in this disaster focused on two particular features. First, these South Island beaches were, like Patagonia, thousands of miles away from major centers of industrial pollution, and they should be the cleanest in the world. Moreover, everything looked fine. Extensive tests had been made of the seawater and the tissues of the dead penguins, and no conclusive results had come from them. But as Howard went on to reveal, the mysterious disease was already spreading. Is it just the penguins that are affected? No, all the seabirds we have in this area were affected last year. We have the spotted shags dying in hundreds. There was hundreds of little blue penguins died. 
unknown causes, just look like starvation, but when you, you tie them up with what happened to the yellow-eyed penguins as far as the mysterious uh, illnesses that come through, something definitely has gone wrong. For me, the evidence from these birds is saying there's a killing agent loose in paradise, and it's almost certainly waterborne. This is not paradise, although, as with most places where whales are found, it continues to look like it. This is the St. Lawrence Seaway, and these brown waters flow directly from the Great Lakes, the largest body of fresh water on Earth, and a notorious hotspot for waterborne industrial pollution. I came to the seaway in 1991 because a special study of pollution had been conducted here on these beautiful animals, a resident population of white beluga whales. Where the Saguenay River joins the seaway, the river is a thousand feet deep and attracts a whole variety of whales. Dr. Pierre Bellon is an expert on pollution in marine mammals. His report confirmed my worst fears about what might be happening to these whales. If you look at beluga whales, what's in their tissues, it's a summary of what has happened to this environment over the last 50 years or so. The industrialization process of North America is recorded in those whales. When a farmer puts DDT on a field, it eventually ends up in soil particles. Then it's taken up by uh, rain, and it ends up in uh, streams, flows into major rivers, and finally ends up in a big lake or in the ocean. Now, those insecticides cannot be degraded. Living organisms have evolved on this planet to use whatever is there as food, as materials for building its own, their own bodies. But insecticides were not there on the planet. They were built by human beings. So there is no organism that can break it down. And organisms cannot excrete them either. So whenever you ingest a particle of DDT, it will be in you for a number of years, sometimes tens and dozens of years, so you will never get rid of it. The longer you live, the more of these fish that you eat, the more contaminated you get, and that's what the story of the beluga is. Just upriver from the beluga whale feeding grounds is the world's largest aluminum plant. Up until a few years ago, this plant used a process which dumped tons of chemicals into the environment via a forest of chimneys. In particular, a compound called benzoate pyrene. Pierre Bellon does not believe his whales are suffering from mysterious, inexplicable illnesses. The problem he believes is human-made, and it's called benzoate pyrene. Now, benzoate pyrene is a carcinogen. It's a chemical that induces cancers in living organisms, in animals. We've done 44 autopsies of beluga whales in the St. Lawrence. Mm. Out of those 44, 18 had tumors, and half of those were cancers. Now, this is an extremely high rate, and the only chemical that we have found in beluga whales from the St. Lawrence that has a potency for inducing cancers is benzoepirine. The others, PCBs, insecticides, mercury, lead, cause certain health problems, but they do not cause cancers. Mortality is only one problem with those whales. You can eliminate a population of animals in two ways. You can either kill the animals or prevent them from reproducing. And this is also occurring within those beluga whales. Some of the chemicals there prevent the females in the beluga population to, from completing their cycles. And they're not having as many calves as they would normally have. And this is keeping the population down continuously. And then, literally out of the blue, came what appeared to be a vindication of Dr. Boulon's theories. Is that a tiny calf? This mother brought her newborn calf across to our boat. Dr. Boulon's reaction confirms the unique nature of the encounter. And a close examination of the calf 
showed a spinal deformity, a common pollution-related condition in these whales. This is a mass stranding of whales. Whales like this get up on beaches all over the world in large numbers and die. Nobody knows why they do it. This group is a group of pilot whales, one of the species most given to this form of mad practice. And the question is, why do they do it? What causes them to do it? Nobody really knows. There are a bunch of theories. One of the ones I think that's most interesting is the theory that some one member of the group gets sick, very sick, and needs to be helped, and the others, socially tied to it for life, come up onto the beach. And when they get up onto the beach, then they die. It was studies just like this one, done by the National Marine Fisheries Service and the U.S. government on these whales, pilot whales, over the years, which showed that pilot whales have, in fact, the ability to transfer PCBs between the mother and her fetus before the fetus is, has even uh, been born. Once it has been born, what happens is that the milk that the mother feeds to its baby also transfers in it, because it's a fat, the PCBs which the mother has collected. So the baby doesn't start as a pristine creature, in this way, what's happening is an accumulation of PCBs, not just up food pyramids, but also across generations. If they last long enough in the tissues of these animals, it means that all whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals, sea lions, anything which accumulates PCBs will eventually be threatened with extinction. And so, as the pilot whales were trucked off to the garbage dump to be added to the refuse from which so many dangerous wastes are now leaching back into the ocean, Roger began to wonder just how widespread and hidden a problem marine pollution had really become. Were any whales safe? Even those swimming to their feeding grounds in the upper latitudes around the pristine polar regions? Roger had begun to suspect that they were not. The world's climate is made round the poles. They're the epicenter of great swirling masses of weather whose arms reach out across the world. Industrial pollutants are now known to leapfrog out towards the poles on the backs of these storms. When the storms and the seas they build hit the poles, particularly the Antarctic continent, they create vast upwellings of nutrients which spawn an explosion of plant life. Microscopic plant life, which blooms in these upwellings, makes these waters into a rich, thick soup, opaque with plankton. And they also feed schools of krill, Everything eats this krill. Seals, penguins, seabirds, and at least six species of whales. The biggest beast in this food chain is the blue whale. At 106 feet, the largest animal ever to live in the history of our planet, or the known universe, for that matter. Is it even vaguely possible that such a monument to life 
which spends its entire existence in an environment all but free of direct human influences, is now threatened. We've got to face up to the global nature of pollution generated by the demands of advanced industrial societies and their vast urban sprawls. When land is first cleared by the burning of the rainforest, the smoke carries around the world. When an industrial plant belches toxic fumes, we all get to breathe them. We are dumping hundreds of thousands of substances into our rivers and our atmospheres. We monitor less than 50 of them and just hope for the best with the others We talk earnestly about being the stewards of the earth, but there isn't the slightest hope that anyone, anywhere, will ever be able to keep track of even 1% of the damage. I see raw sewage. You know, it's almost The great waterways that drain the major cities on earth are already polluted beyond redemption, as I was to discover from John Cronin, who monitors the water quality in New York's Hudson River. I, um, you know, I look around and I see a river that's less industrialized than it's ever been in its history, that has more pollution lying in its sediments and in its fish than it's ever had in history. Wow. Uh, we're living with a legacy now of toxics, and hazardous wastes, oil spills, um, sewage. Most of the stuff that we still have in the river will be, be washing into the ocean for hundreds of years. Uh, it's the sad legacy. If we stopped everything now, if we stopped all the pollutants now, we would still be looking at decades upon decades of the transport of pollutants via the Hudson River to the ocean. Well, this is Indian Point Nuclear Facility. Uh, it uses a million gallons a minute of cooling water, and along with that million gallons comes the fish. And it kills millions of fish a year, or it can kill millions of fish a year. Uh, this is one of our greatest battles on the Hudson River, and we forced them to install about $20 million worth of fish saving equipment here to reduce those fish kills significantly. So you won in this case. Yeah, this is a battle we've won. Uh, we've had about 50 cases over the past several years, all of which we've won, which gives me, of course, great hope. And if we can do it here, it can be done anywhere. Uh, you know, Margaret Mead was once asked, can a small group of individuals uh, really make a difference if they're dedicated and aware? And she said, you know, it's the only thing that's ever made a difference in this world. There's a small group of dedicated individuals. So what you're saying is that others can do what you have done, and by using litigation as a force, they can actually win and change the world. Litigation is one way, but it raises the standards of your community. If you can raise the standards of your community, you can win. You won't win every battle, but you'll win the war. If, if you're fighting for the right, you'll win the war. That's, that's the lessons of history. That may be the lesson of past history, but today it has a distinctly old-fashioned ring to it. Indeed, can it hold true into our future? And friendly wishes to all who may encounter this voyager and receive this message. Are the tapes aboard the Voyager spacecraft really a testimonial to intelligent life on Earth? Is it intelligent to pollute the seas and destroy our atmosphere with chemicals which contribute to nothing but the human way of life? Will the other intelligences which Voyager hopes one day to meet accept our claims to being an advanced, caring race? If the voices of whales which are also aboard the craft, can be heard no more on Earth.
Here is a message which comes from the ocean to us from Wales directly. And this message is an extremely important one. What it says is that it is possible to own a brain as complex, for all I know, more complex than our own, without destroying the world. What we have to learn from that message is that what we do also must not destroy the world, or we have no future. Everything that we love, believe in, hold dear in our lives will be lost unless we change the way we think, which is, will what I'm doing diminish the ability of the environment to support life? And if so, don't do it. Whales have for all their 20 million years, that's 19 million longer than ours, they have succeeded in actually living in the world without destroying it. We could do the same.